Today I'm going to tell you stories about the brutal murder of a girl by her horrible friends. Make yourselves comfortable and we'll get to the story. On the evening of July 1, 2020, in the city of Culiacan, Mexico, an 18-year-old girl named Lydia Anda Beltran was abducted from her home. This all happened in front of her grandmother, who, due to her age, couldn't do anything. The next day, an investigation was initiated, which led the officers to unravel one of the most gruesome murders in Mexico. Lydia Anda Beltran was born in 2002 in Culiacan, a city in the state of Sinaloa. She was the second of three siblings and spent her entire childhood and youth in this city in northwest Mexico. Lydia lived with her grandmother Andrea in the Lupa Victoria neighborhood as she had little contact with her mother. Maria Vivian lived with her husband in Costa Rica, also located in Sinaloa. In the middle of 2020, like any other 18-year-old, Lydia enjoyed spending time with friends, going to parties, and hanging out. She was a sociable and popular girl with many acquaintances. In addition to that, her appearance drew attention. Lydia was 1.70 meters tall, had long black hair, and light hazel eyes. According to a report published in the newspaper El Sol de Sinaloa, Lydia's uncle, named Braulio, said that they loved his niece very much, and she lived a vibrant life. In his opinion, Lydia and her friends were partygoers, which he considered a normal phenomenon among young people. At one of these parties, Lydia met Paula Narita Medina, who worked as a nurse and had an older sister named Alina Milagros Medina. She also interacted with Irandi Menares, a mother of two small children. The connection with these girls happened instantly, and in a very short time, they became good friends, or at least that's how it seemed. Lydia couldn't have imagined that her life would change forever with them. On the evening of June 30, 2020, Lydia went out to have some fun. Despite it being a Tuesday, she first went to a small party where Paula and Randy were also present. Other friends, including Itzel, who everyone called La China, were at this party too. After the party, Lydia and her friends decided to go for a ride in Paula and Randy's friend's car. They visited various places, including a popular lookout point. Eventually, they decided to go to Kelly Michelle Ibera's house, an underage girl known to all the group members. According to information published in the newspaper Cuadrat in Sinaloa, Kelly invited them to stay overnight, which matches Lydia's uncle's statements. According to him, Lydia told her family that she would spend the night at her friend's house. That evening, according to the girls, they had a great time, chatting, watching movies, and then going to their respective rooms to sleep. On the following day, July 1, 2020, Lydia and Itzel received several calls from Kelly, who informed them that someone had stolen jewelry from her house. The girls were already at their homes and claimed not to know anything about it, but they still decided to inquire with their friends. They also agreed to inform Kelly if they found out anything. Afterward, Kelly told Paula about what had happened, and she came up with a plan to help her friend recover the stolen valuables. According to information published in some media outlets, the nurse told her that she had acquaintances who could use violent methods to make the thief confess. That evening, around 6.30 p.m., Lydia was at home with her grandmother when someone rang the doorbell. Upon opening the door, she saw Paula and Kelly, who looked very upset and, with some cruelty, asked her again about the jewelry. They were so insistent that, in her nervous state, Lydia pointed to Itzel as the one responsible for the theft. Paula and Kelly then forcefully persuaded Lydia to go with them to Itzel's house to resolve the matter. They practically forced Lydia into a gray Toyota Corolla, with Irandi at the wheel, accompanied by her two children and Alina, Paula's sister. When they arrived at Itzel's house, located not far from Boulevard Nicolas Bravo, the situation became much more tense. Paula and Kelly struck Lydia in the face, aggressively demanding that she return the stolen jewelry. Although Itzel repeatedly denied her involvement, the girls didn't believe her and continued to interrogate her with increasing cruelty. In the midst of this complex situation, Lydia broke down. She couldn't bear to see how harshly they were treating her friend, so she took responsibility for the robbery and claimed that the stolen valuables were at her home. Paula and Kelly again used force to make Lydia get into the car and take her to the house where she lived with her grandmother. The two girls threatened Lydia, saying they would beat her with a board and inflict serious bodily harm if she wasted their time. They then searched her bag and found some of the stolen valuables. 
Lydia was very scared and promised to pay for the loss, but Paula and Kelly were furious and couldn't understand why she had done that. Despite obtaining Lydia's confession about part of the stolen items and her promise to pay, they forcibly pushed her back into the car and took her away from her home. Lydia's grandmother witnessed everything, and that was the last time she saw her granddaughter. Since then, no one in the family had heard anything about her. As soon as Maria Vivian, Lydia's mother, found out, she contacted Itzel, who shared some details of what had happened. She also found photos of her daughter's friends on social media, printed them out, and showed them to Andrea, the grandmother. Andrea immediately recognized the girls who had kidnapped her granddaughter. With all this information in hand, Lydia's mother went to the prosecutor's office and filed a report in which she accused Paul, Irandi, Kelly, and Alina of her daughter's disappearance. On the morning of Thursday, July 2, 2020, a completely burned human body was found in an empty lot in the El Barrio area of Kuliak. The remains were so severely damaged that identifying the person was not possible. It was also impossible to determine from initial observations whether it was a man or a woman. Given all the evidence collected at the scene, the prosecutor's office initiated a murder case for an unidentified person. Simultaneously, efforts were made to identify Lydia and investigate the circumstances of her death. DNA samples from Lydia's family were collected for comparative DNA analysis, although everyone hoped she would be found alive. As the investigation continued, Experts progressed with the genetic analysis. On July 12, 2020, a preliminary hearing took place, during which the three detainees were charged with Lydia's violent disappearance. Pre-trial detention orders were issued for them. Investigators also obtained geolocation records from the suspect's phones to determine their movements after Lydia's abduction. The data showed that Paula, Kelly, and Alina who were still at large, traveled together from the afternoon of July 1st to the morning of July 2nd. The records indicated that they were in Guamachil, Chile, and El Salvador Alvarado before returning to Culiac. The police were still searching for the missing girl when they received news that no one wanted to hear. On July 14th, it was announced that, according to DNA test results, the charred remains found on July 2nd belonged to 18-year-old Lydia Anda Beltran. Her family and loved ones were devastated to learn that Lydia had died in such a gruesome attack. Investigators determined that after brutally beating Lydia, the perpetrators doused her with a flammable liquid and set her on fire. The investigation took an unexpected turn, and authorities had to focus on establishing whether the people charged with her disappearance were also involved in her death. After a lengthy interrogation, Kelly confessed to the prosecutor that she was only involved in Lydia's disappearance. She was transferred to a special court for minors since she had not yet reached the age of majority. Paul and Arandi appeared before a second judge named Juan Luis Bertrand, and their public defender, Maritza Manchado, requested the charges related to Lydia's disappearance be dropped on the grounds that the prosecution couldn't establish the extent of their direct involvement in the alleged crime. So far, it had only been proven that they were present when Paula and Kelly took Lydia from her home. The judge agreed with the defense's arguments and decided to release Paula. However, he ordered her not to leave the city, making it possible to rearrest her if new evidence emerged. In Alina's case, her lawyer, the state defender Hugo Arardi Robles, requested that the charges related to Lydia's disappearance be dropped as the victim's remains had already been found and new charges should be brought. However, the judge rejected his arguments and ordered her to remain in pretrial detention pending the completion of the investigation. Meanwhile, Lydia's family expressed their gratitude to those who participated in the search for her through social media. They also announced that the individuals responsible for her death were in custody. Several days after the identification of the body, and the initiation of the process of holding the alleged criminals accountable, investigators continued their search for the missing girl. Once again, police conducted searches, gathering evidence that could shed light on the case. Additionally, in order to identify the burnt body found on July 2nd, the family agreed to provide blood samples for comparative DNA analysis. However, all relatives and friends of Lydia were still hopeful that she would be found alive. Friends and colleagues of the victim held a protest action from the Cathedral of Culiac and to the State Prosecutor's Office of Sinaloa, carrying signs and wearing green shirts. 
Demonstrators marched and chanted slogans, demanding the crime be solved and the culprits be imprisoned. Participants in the demonstration raised their voices, saying that Lydia was taken alive and that they needed her alive. During the demonstration, people demanded that the case be solved and called for an end to violent abductions of women and femicides. According to the Executive Secretariat of the National Public Security System, as of May 2020, there were six cases of intentional murder of women registered in the state of Sinaloa. Additionally, from January to June of the same year, 13 investigations into femicides were conducted. Femicide is a crime under the Mexican Penal Code. On Wednesday, July 22, 2020, a closed hearing was held and representatives of the media were not allowed to attend. Marlon Medina Lopez, the special prosecutor for violence against women and vulnerable groups, assured Judge Caxiolo Rivera that Arandi and Paula were jointly involved in Lydia's disappearance and murder. Arandi, who had been released a few days earlier due to a lack of evidence of her direct involvement, lost this advantage after the prosecution presented new evidence against her. Kelly and Paula's sister Elena, who was still on the run, were also charged with involvement in the crime. Months passed, but the legal process against the defendants did not progress as reported in the media. In October 2021, it was mentioned that more than a year after the crime, Paula and Arandi were still in prison in Culiacan, Sinaloa. It was also reported that Alina was still at large. However, other sources claimed that Kelly was not actually a minor, and that her parents had deliberately misled to avoid her being tried as an adult. Lydia's family and loved ones continued to seek justice on social media, posting messages accompanied by images of the accused. They also regularly organized protests, demanding punishment and calling for a swift investigation that would lead to Alina's arrest. On Saturday, June 25, 2022, exactly two years after the crime against Lydia, a sentencing hearing took place at the regional headquarters of the criminal accusation system Ural Centro. Supervising Judge Griselo Perez found Paula and Arandi guilty of the crime related to the murder of a woman and acquitted them of the charge of disappearance committed by private individuals. The judge described all the events that had taken place and cited the evidence that supported the guilty verdict. She also mentioned that the involvement of three men in the incident had been established, but their identities remained unknown. The judge scheduled a new hearing for June 30th of the same year, at which Kelly, who was claimed to be a minor at the time of the incident, would receive her sentence. She was sentenced to three years in prison. Meanwhile, Alina was still on the run and wanted for the murder of a woman and her involvement in the case. Additionally, it was revealed that Alina had provided her home for the interrogation and brutal beating of the victim on July 1, 2020. On July 1, 2022, Exactly two years after the crime against Lydia, the state prosecutor's office of Sinaloa announced in a press release that Paula Neride Medina had been sentenced to 50 years in prison after being declared the main perpetrator of the woman's murder. In the same sentence, Irandi Menaris was sentenced to 24 years, 9 months, and 1 day in prison for the murder of Lydia. Both girls were also ordered to pay a monetary compensation of approximately 440 Mexican pesos, which at the time amounted to just over $20,000. Lydia's relatives expressed satisfaction with the sentences handed down, although it clearly did not diminish their grief. On the other hand, one of the named individuals, Alina Milagros Medina, was still at large, and they stated that they would continue to demand the continuation of the investigation to secure her arrest and bring her to justice. They also hoped that the truth about the alleged involvement of three men in the crime would eventually be revealed. Lydia Anda Beltran was described as a cheerful, kind, and energetic 18-year-old girl. She made a mistake for which she paid with her life. Those who were supposed to be her friends did not give her a chance to redeem herself and chose such a gruesome method to seek justice. That's the end of it. Try to choose your friends more carefully. I ask you to like the video and write in the comments what you think about this case. And you can also watch the past video, which is now showing in the middle of your screen.